Okay, uh, it's a brutal schedule, and we're an hour and a half into a long schedule. I'm going to ask you to stand up for a moment. And actually, there's two versions. There's two versions. Actually, stand up here for a minute and have your participate in a little survey. So I got into this field of, of evolution of aging because I realized uh, 15 years ago when I started that the field was a mess, that people, there was a great diversity among people who thought they knew the answer, uh, what the answer was. And I, I think that persists today. So um, I'm going to ask you, what, how do you think aging evolved? And I'm going to give you four choices, and you get to sit down when you choose yours, and that way everybody votes exactly once. So I'll give you a, a few seconds to read this over and see what do you believe about how aging evolved. So number one is antagonistic pleiotropy is the name for it. It means that there's a biological trade-off between early fitness and keeping the body healthy so that it lasts longer. Uh, please sit down if that's your idea of how aging evolved. Great. Uh, number two is the metawar hypothesis, that aging really doesn't exist in the wild, that so few, uh, so few animals last that long. The people who are sitting down now, th those for number two? <coughs> Thank you. Number three is programmed aging, that evolution actually wants us to get old and die because it promotes population turnover, and that, that there would be no evolution without population turnover. And number four, aging really doesn't have much to do with evolution. It's a wear and tear process. Okay. So maybe that illustrates my point. That there's a great diversity. And yet people have confidence that their, their idea is the right one. And if you ask the experts, the experts in this field are the worst. They are completely pig-headed on the subject and immune to new, new data. Um, I, I was actually tempted to put a number five on here, which is the quip from Max Planck. Science progresses funeral by funeral. <laughs> so, some of you are familiar with my work. I, I believe, close to number three, that aging is an evolutionary program. And since that's sort of a premise of what we can say today, I'm going to go over the reasons I believe that, but quickly, and leave you to uh, look at other things that I've written for, for a compilation of that evidence. So the first reason I think that aging is programmed is hormesis. The body can prolong life, not just when it's pampered, but both the body prolongs life when conditions are the most harsh, like starvation. So what is it exactly that the body is able to do when it's starved that it couldn't possibly do if it had enough food. And that, that to me is an indication that the body is not trying its hardest to live as long as it can. Second is the genetic basis for aging is highly conserved across huge spans in evolutionary space, going back to the first eukaryotes. Now, of course, there's a, there are a lot of genes that are conserved like this, but they all control core metabolism, things that evolution considers absolutely essential to life. So aging is in this category that evolution has treated as if it were essential to life. Third, uh, none of the theories of aging apply to one-celled creatures, protists. And yet there are two affirmative modes of, self de of cell death that both exist in protists. They are apoptosis um, as, um, as documented by Longo a, a decade ago and um, cellular senescence by a telomeres, which is the way most protists uh, die if they don't have sex. Fourth, if you breed animals for longevity, there you you get a lot of longevity out of a little bit of breeding. Apparently, there's a lot of diversity for genes of, of, that um, control for aging. And some of these 
don't have any fertility deficits. In fact, sometimes breeding for long life also promotes uh, fertility, which is exactly the opposite of what the pleiotropy theory is predicting. And fifth, this is really technical, but for people who are in my field who know about additive genetic variants, this was R.A. Fisher's thesis. This is the measure of what is an adaptation and what is just genetic drift. And the additive genetic variance for mortality goes steeply down with age, indicating that it's uh, an adaptation. So um, I'm going to refer you for, for details on this. Usually I give a whole hour long talk just on those five points. But I'm going to refer you for details if you want to read more to a chapter in a book that came out a few years ago, edited by um, our colleague Greg Fay. And uh, my chapter is downloadable from free for those of you who don't have academic uh, privileges. You can get it free from the, the site listed there. So why do we care about this? What, why, why does it make a difference what we think the origin of aging is? Well, it makes a difference because if your idea is that aging has been trying and trying and trying for a billion years to optimize our lifespan, and this is as well as it's been able to do, we have to take over from there. It's our job to engineer something that evolution wasn't able to do. We've got a tough road to hoe. It's a hard problem. But suppose you think that evolution wants us to die, that there are pro-aging mechanisms built into the body, and they're turned on by certain signals. Then our job is a lot easier. All we do is find that signal, understand the body's signaling mechanism well enough that we're able to interfere with the signals, send it the young signals instead of the old signals, and the body will repair itself. So I'm, I'm going to ask for another show of hands. Uh, uh, there are these two approaches to anti-aging work. One is to repair what's wrong with the body, number one, and the other is to signal the body to do the repairs itself. It's simplistic, but I'm going to ask you to commit yourself to one or two. Which do you think is the, um, the more promising approach for anti-aging science? Number one, repair the body. Or number two, to uh, signal the body to repair itself. Or, or both. Yeah, that's certainly legitimate to think about. So it was about a year ago, thinking in this way, that I came to the idea that if I really believe that aging is programmed, then the body must have a clock. It must be some central determination, or probably several central determinations of how old the body is, and the body reads off the clock how old it is and adjusts its metabolism accordingly. It was actually, it's a simple idea, but it was a deep thought. It took months of going back and forth before I convinced myself. And I ask you to go through that process if you think it's worthwhile. Do you think that programmed aging implies that there is one or more central clocks controlling the process? Um, a clock I define as having two parts. It has a timekeeping mechanism, which counts the hours and the days. It can be flexible. The clock goes more slowly if you exercise and don't eat much. It goes faster if you're a couch potato. Um, but it, it keeps track of time. And the other part is a face, where the, um, the time can be read off and actually determine something about the metabolism. I believe minutes. that the... What? We have two minutes. Two minutes? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do what I can. <laughs> so the main part of my presentation <laughs> is going to be, what are the possible clocks? I think telomeres are well proven as a clock. We know the mechanism. The mechanism is the telomeres get shorter with each cell division, and we know that uh, short telomeres lead to not only a deficit of the cells that we, the stem cells that we need to renew ourselves, but also short telomeres signal uh, 
a cell to go into senescence when it spews out all these pro-inflammatory cytokines. It actually poisons the rest of the body. And just removing these senescent cells has been associated with anti-aging. I think the hypothalamus, which was, mes- uh, I think it was mentioned by Dr. Tsai on Tuesday, as a central place in the brain where we might look more for an anti-aging clock or an aging clock and be able to interfere with it. I just say it's more subject to more research. I don't know about that. I'm putting my bets on, on first telomeres for near-term results. The thymus gets smaller with age, and the thymus is where T cells are trained. I think the th- thymus is a lot responsible for the immune aging. And finally, I came across this paper, which was written by some people in, in this room here. Uh, just a year ago, I came across this paper, and it really changed my thinking about biological clocks. Suppose that the methylation state of the genome is itself a clock. It's sort of a hidden clock, because <laughs> this slide didn't come through. It's the center of my presentation. <laughs> So the idea that was supposed to be on this slide is that um, gene expression feeds into the body. One of the things that gene expression does is that it, it gets transduced by this signal transduction mechanism. It's very complicated. And out come a series of signals, including um, pro- promoters and inhibitors for the next generation of gene expression. So that completes a circle and gives you the idea that there could be a clock there. There could be a clock associated with gene expression and nothing else. And we wouldn't find it in any particular organ in the body or in any particular place. And a year ago I thought, gee, this is not optimistic after all. We have to solve the whole problem of gene expression in old people and gene expression in young people and then we need to control it. But I was really heartened yesterday by hearing... Uh, George Church's talk, which says that we're much further along on that path than I'd ever realized, that in fact we are within striking distance of actually being able to program gene expression, and um, I think that that will have the effect of resetting one of the body's principal clocks. And usually this is the part that goes to where, where I thank all the people that sponsored me I've been sponsored by family money all my life, and I ran out. I was stupid in the stock market a few years ago, and I can't do this much longer. And uh, I ask for your help. If you're connected to funding sources or if you have ideas, um, please let me know. I'm I'm okay, but in in the next few years, I need to find funding for my research. Thank you for your attention. Thanks for the opportunity.